love that song because it's called Flawless and I screw it up in here. <laughs> Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Amen. <laughs> Don't give me a straight line, please. <laughs>
coffee in the sky again. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as the red light flips on, it's red. But it's not red yet. Sorry. That's what you're supposed to well, the words of that song really say a lot. You know, it's a Father's Day for what it means to stand and be a father, to be a dad. And we're going to look at that a little bit today um, as we talk about Father's Day. What does it mean? And we talked a little bit last week about God in the role of Father and His discipline. We're going to retouch that a little bit as well. We'll talk about how that is a part of the love that not only does he have in the, really the um, inspiration for fatherhood, what we, are, what we are to attain to, we can never reach, but he gives us that example uh, in his life. But before we get there, do we have any announcements at all? Well, I have an announcement. Last year, uh, Cecilia, last year, hi. Hi, Cecilia. Hi, Cecilia. Hi. Hello. and um, everyone was bringing their children, or grandchildren, it was working out great. So at 10 o'clock, I was having Bible study, and someone was there to watch the children, and then at 12 o'clock, we were having pool day. So, it was, or some people were skipping Bible study and just bringing, um, bringing their children or grandchildren for pool day. So it was, that's fine with me too. So this year, I was thinking about doing a Bible study with Joyce Myers, um, listening, um, actually, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, or um, hearing God's word with Joyce Myers, or something like that. Um, I have to look into Amazon on the Bible study itself, but a lot of us, um, I know I did the Bible study years ago with Henry Blackaby, it was an old-fashioned style um, Bible study, but I know it was life-changing for me, but I thought maybe Joyce Myers would have been a, a nice, more up-to-date um, Bible study on listening and hearing and knowing God's word and how to discern God's word and how to listen and read the Bible and just listen and understand how to hear God's word every day, not just reading the Bible, but understanding how to hear God's word, not just by the Bible, but and people you meet and, and, and every, everyday situations. But that is, I haven't got all the details yet, but it is full day Wednesdays at the Mac Williams. So I want to do that again this year. So I'll get more information, and everyone's welcome. So it's and Wednesdays, not this Wednesday, no, obviously. No, we're waiting right. for school to get out. Right. Because I won't have any children. So, right. um, but anyway, this will be year two doing that, and I will have more information to follow. Okay. Sounds great. I'll right. do a great job anyway, so. I was just going to say, I really do appreciate all you men and your dads. And I know some don't even have children, but still your guidance to all the kids. And I want to say, guess what? We busted you guys for Mother's Day about doing something, and we failed. Because <laughs> us women didn't do anything for you for Father's Day. No, so, you guys made coffee. So, Thank you. <laughs> Why do I do that? That is very important. Not, as, not just as a father, but here to make the coffee, because I totally can't get it. <laughs> that's great. It was, it was you know, a little crazy for everybody for this one. That's all right. That's all right. Um, that's why we do what we do. It's not um, church, oh, you've got to be here on time. You've got to make sure you do it. No, it's just come and be. And guess what? If things don't go exactly as they planned, welcome to the hangar, because that's the way it goes, right? So, anyway, um, we appreciate all of what everybody does to make this happen and you know it's a good thing it's a good thing um we talked about fathers and some people not having children and you know to be a father isn't necessarily to have children certainly to be a dad is much more than just having children i googled father's day and one of the first 20 <coughs> things that i saw when it came to father's day that popped up were gifts, best gifts. What kind of gift do we get them? And I thought about that. And I, yeah, why, first of all, why is that the first thing that comes up? Because everybody's trying to sell stuff, of course, right? But, yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, but, you know, it, it pops up. The first 20 things were, were the best gifts to dad. And it made me think, why do we get gifts? And for whom? What if dad's a jerk? 
it's a question you gotta ask because guess what? Not everyone has that perfect dad, right? You know? Um, as a matter of fact, no one has the perfect dad. We try, but there are some that don't even try. And when it comes to getting gifts, and you want to get a gift for this guy who's just a jerk all year long, why do you do it? Because it's Father's Day, we have to get a gift, right? Is that why we would do it? And if you give him this gift, is it to say, thanks for being such a great dad, or is it to make him feel guilty for being such a jerk all year long, and it's like, thanks for being dad, and then when he gets it, he's like, oh man, I'm kind of a jerk. I mean, it makes sense, right? Nobody wants to ask those questions. Because it's Father's Day, we don't do that stuff on Father's Day. You can't be negative, it's got to be all like, but I can't help myself. I always go to the root of the question and go, why do we do these things? What, what is it about it? So then I ask, so what is a dad? And what is a father? And is there a difference between a dad and a father? Some would say, well, a father is just someone who, you know, physically um, was part of the process of having children. Some would say that. And I don't even know if I agree with that part of it, because I think there's more to a father than that. As we spoke of um, just before I started, that the fact that God the Father gave us that example so that we could look to Him. And as Cheryl had said earlier, um, and it is really in miniature, what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that we, you know, growing up, my dad died when I was seven years old. Is that correct, Mom? Seven. Yeah. And so how much did I really know about dad? I didn't know that much. I really didn't. Um, but I still love him. Is that odd? Is that just because he's my father? Because he brought me into this world? And is that special bond and connection through that? I don't know. Well, I can't wait to see him when I get to heaven and really get to know him. I don't know if I want to hear what he has to say about how I've run my life, but, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of years built up. He's going, listen, hey, love you, great, here's the hugs. All right, now, nah, we need to talk. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, is that the place he was going to follow? What's the essence? Because some would say, you know, same difference, same meaning, different words, but what's the essence of the man we call dad or father? What is the essence of that? As I said, I didn't have much time growing up to learn about the things that my dad had. But I did have memories. And I did have an example. Even in that short time. I remember one of the things we used to do is we crawled into the bed. Now, there were six little rug rats, okay? Their bedroom was probably the size of this stage. Okay? Really, it was small. Remember that? We had the front room. And we were right outside of it. And so... In the morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, we'd all crawl into, into the bed, and there was, you know, mom and dad trying to go, where are we, and what's going on here? So six little rug rats running around in the bed with them, and my dad used to say something every morning. He quote a scripture. You know what it was, Cheryl? Yeah, I do. What is it? This is the day that the Lord has made us rejoice and be glad in Remember those words? Yeah. Okay. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Something he would say all the time. And that memory alone gives me something to hang my thoughts and my memories and my understanding of who Dad was. Because if that's one of the things that I remember him saying, obviously, it was important. His playing guitar, did that pass down through somehow to me? I'm sure I used to play a little wooden, just wooden cutout of a guitar as he was playing. And I'd run around the house and play that. Um, and obviously John plays guitar as well. So there's, there's something there to the fact that Dad passed on these things, even though we didn't have that much time. So, Father. But then one day, Dennis came into the house. Not Father. But dad, at first I thought, what is this guy doing? What's he thinking? <laughs> I didn't know what to think or how to act or how to feel. This was new to me. What was he feeling like? He had six of us. 
And as I said, enough about me, poor Dennis, there were six of us and one of them was me. <laughs> he had an instant family. And I sometimes steal this opportunity to say things, so I'm going to. You were patient, kind, loving, and insane. <laughs> what were you thinking? And you loved my mom in a way that showed us why you were really there. You stayed the course, okay? Um, you plotted your course, there's the sale analogy, that's your gift for Father's Day. Um, and you stayed the course of love even though it was extremely difficult. And I know it was. I know because I made it difficult. But you showed me in your response what a, what a dad was. And I thank you for that. And I didn't really recognize that until I met Christ. Until I came to a faith in Jesus. It enlivened in me. It woke up in me many things that I didn't understand before. And now I started to understand fatherhood. And being a dad. And what it meant. And that I saw it in Dennis all those years. We talked last week about discipline, and the root of that word is disciple, to bring alongside towards love, a nudging, a directing, uh, a guiding. And that's in Hebrews 12, 6 that we read that last week, and let me just read it again. I'll, I'll start here, it's a little before 6. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. I think I talked to you a little bit last week about that. That if I saw some kid in the mall ripping off something, I might say, hey, what are you doing? The kid takes off. Am I going to chase him down? Am I going to tell him, stop doing that? Hey, this kid didn't know. Not my kid. I mean, I might say something like I said if I caught him, but how much do I really care about that kid? But if my own child did, what am I going to do? I'm going to step up and say, whoa, 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 no, 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 come here, come here, come here. We need to deal with this. We would have a conversation, and the next day I would bring them to the store manager and say, now tell them what you did. And why would I do that? What is discipline? Is it me being mean? Maybe a little. It's me trying to nudge and guide and bring the best situation and the best action in that situation for the best result. It's love. And as I thought about that and I was reading um, in the scripture, I saw something that kind of struck me as the same. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, it says this, speaking of the devil and God giving this advice, resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. It's the family. The family of believers. He talks about us as family and that we will go through hard times. Again, remember that God will bring discipline, that discipleship, that moving along in your life. Because why? Before he didn't ever do anything. Do you ever notice as a Christian, remember I talked the other week, it's a little more difficult for life as a Christian because things just don't go flowing along. You have decisions to make, not based on what you have to do, but based on what you choose to do because of who you know. And as you become a believer, God's discipline is in your life. Because it says He will discipline you as His children. <coughs> so have you ever noticed some of the things that most people just go along and get away with it. Nothing, nothing happens. You think, oh, they got a pretty good life. Man, and they are some of the worst people I know. And then, you as a believer, you're going along and you're doing kind of what you feel is the right thing for the most part. And you keep getting these little things that get in the way. And frustrating and annoying and heartbreaking and all those things. Do you ever notice that? The Bible says that God's discipline is in our lives as soon as we become children and he's nutting us and he's pushing us and he's using some of these things. I'm not saying everything that bad that happens is for God. Believe me. 
But he'll use some of these things to gently push us and nudge us in a direction. And so, again, 9 and 10, I read, so it's talking about us. Stand firm then, uh, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. It is something that God allows and brings in and uses it for a good purpose. And it says, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, um, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What is he doing in the process of these trials and this struggle? As a father, he's pushing us to different places where we normally wouldn't go. He's sending us places and having us experience things because in that, we become stronger, we become more understanding, and we go places that otherwise we wouldn't bother. How many, it's probably just me, but how many of you um, just push yourself to go to new places, to new heights, to learn new things every day? Sometimes you do. How many have good intentions of that? How many New Year's resolutions do we say, oh, this is going to be a good year, and then within, you know, first three weeks, for me, it was like the hardest five minutes of my life, you know, that kind of thing? <laughs> God wants to, as this good father, to bring us places, and he knows that we won't go there or not. And so he lovingly injects things into our lives and allows things that are injected even by others, because as we, as we read that first part, he's talking about Satan wanting to do what? Just like I didn't care about the kid at the store that's stealing something because it wasn't my child. And God loves us now that we are His children. He's going to move us along. Who else gets in the fight as soon as we become believers? And we forget about this quite often. Satan no longer likes us. He didn't like us to begin with, but he could care less about it. Whatever. They're just doing whatever. They're being idiots. Leave them alone. They have nothing in this world that's going to make a difference. And as soon as you became a believer, a child of God, you became an enemy of Satan. He no longer thought of you as nothing. Because you have now the potential of what? Sharing your faith. Not necessarily in words, but just by who you are. And then others will see. And so, as you see this first um, verse, it says, resist him. Resist Satan. Get out of the way. Stern, stand firm in your faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same suffering. We know that we have those struggles, and some of them are as a result of who we are in Christ. But it can make us so much better. There was a time where, um, growing up, Jackie went through a little bit of a struggle. Now, Jackie's pretty much perfect, right? We all know that. <laughs> Amen. Um, <laughs> preacher brother, give it up to you. Not sworn in this opportunity. Um, but you know, good kids, oh my gosh, the kids were great, you know, um, growing up, even though there was all sorts of little quirks that you decided to get into, every one of you got into your own different little trouble spots, um, for the most part, you guys were fantastic. But one of the times that Jackie um, was struggling, um, I remember I was out in the, in the garage and I was working on my car, and all of a sudden I... I smelled cigarettes. I, I left in the house, I came back, I smelled cigarettes, and Jackie's standing there, and I'm like, you know, you weren't smoking, were you? And she said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> gotcha. So I said, okay, so grab my tools, of course I knew she was smoking. And so I continued to work in the car, and I was just kind of quiet for a minute, that sound pause. And I said, Cause, man, I would sure hate to lose all the trust we have over something stupid like cigarettes. Kept working. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> you know, that's all you could hear, nothing. But Jackie kind of just moved away and disappeared, and I thought, okay. I kind of forgot about it. I knew that I had planted something there, I knew that I started, but I just was like, all right, whatever, I'll deal with it later, we'll, we'll kind of deal with it. And um, the next day I get a call from school. I think I've shared this before, but I get a call from school, and they were like, you need to come here. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? 
your daughter is, is out of control. She's crying, like completely losing on everything. And, but, and they're like looking at me when I walked in to come get it. They're looking at me like, like I beat this kid. <laughs> I never hit this kid. I never had to. I mean, when she was this small, they didn't know what kind of thing in the pamper. You know, the pamper always takes all that. It sounds like a big paw. But I mean, the pamper takes all that. So I mean, that's how long ago it had been. So I walk in and they're like, She's in the other room. She's got, you got to talk to her. So I'm like, okay. So I walk in. I go in. And she had written a letter. And we sat and we talked. And she said, I, I, I lied to you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I can tell you, you're good at a lot of things, but lying's not one of them. And um, so anyway, we had this great talk. And I said to her, I said, you know, we're going to have to go back to like the beginning. We're going to have to go back, and it's going to seem punitive. It's going to seem like I'm treating you like a little kid. But I said, that's not what's happening. What we need to do is we need to break down the stone wall. Because see, what happens is trust is like a stone wall. For those of you that have heard this a million times from me, check out, go to sleep. I'm going to say it again. So, so it's like a stone wall. If a car runs into the stone wall, you just take the bricks and just throw them all on top of you, like take the stones and just throw them back on top of each other. John, you build stone walls all the time. What needs to be in place before you can build that wall up? Foundation. foundation. The foundation. And so we had to go back to the foundation. We had to tear it down. And so we had to do stupid little things like, okay, whenever you leave with your friends, you're going to talk to me first. You're going to tell me where you're going. You're going to call me when you get there. <coughs> Believe me, I put her through this. Can you imagine? <laughs> When you get there, you call me. You call me every hour on the hour, whether you're there still or not. And if you leave and go somewhere else, you call me and you let me know. Right? Mm -hmm. That was the deal. Was there anything I'm missing? No, and this was before texting. This was before cell phones and texting. <laughs> she had to find a phone and she had to make sure she was around me. And you know what? I said, don't mess this up because guess what? If you mess this up, we have to stay at this level. But if you can get this and build that foundation, then we can start to build the next foundation and the next foundation. The next one. And it's funny because she, she did absolutely stuck with it a thousand percent. She kept calling. And then I said, okay, you know what? Just let me know when you're leaving. And um, give me a call if you're going to leave and go somewhere else. And so that was the next stage. And so the next stage after that was going to be, okay, you know what, you really have shown me and we've built this and I feel strong and trust. And it, it came to a point where I said, thank you so much. We really good. You know what she kept doing until she was like 22? <laughs> hey, Dad, I'm, I'm going to be going out with another, you know. But it was a beautiful thing that came from because we did rebuild something that was broken. And I believe that when we did it, it became stronger than it was before. This is part of what dads do. Not perfectly by a long shot, believe me, because this is the one story I think maybe I had a little success <laughs> the rest of them were. Don't talk to her about the other stories. Put that way. But no, I mean, it's one of those things where God's Word really gave that clarity and said, listen, take these steps. Take the time. Do this. Because this is what will make a difference. And when we look at God and we look at His discipline, talk about that the other week. <coughs> so often, discipline has a what? Negative connotation, right? It feels like it's something bad. But the root word of that being disciple should give us the key. And the fact that God is behind it is huge because he's the perfect one. He's the one that doesn't mess up. He's the one that doesn't, isn't absent-minded and, oh, I forgot you at school. Where's Janelle? I'm here today. Uh, because I've done that. He was supposed to pick me up. I didn't remember. Right? Anybody else? Have you done that with my kids? I mean, it was only two days. But no. Um, yeah, I forgot and just was like, didn't even know. And those kind of things, see, we as fathers fail, but God's love never fails. And as his children, as those who have accepted him, he is going to bring discipline into your life. He's going to nudge. He's going to push. And it's not always going to feel comfortable, right? But why is he doing it? He's doing it because he loves us. Because he has a plan. And the plan is not the one that we would do. And he said, if I'm going to get you there, I'm going to have to get you out off your butt. <coughs> you ever heard of the uh, footprints in the sand? Right? 
And it was this set of footprints, hand in hand, over, the, over time, and they look back, and then at one point, the person says, God, I saw the footprints, but then there was only one set of footprints. Why'd you leave me alone? And he says, I didn't leave you alone. It was there I carried you, right? There are times when God carries us, but there's a lot more times where he, where he nudges us. And as one Christian comedian said, it's not called butt prints in the sand. Okay, so sometimes he has to get us up off our butts and scoot us along. But it's because of his love. As fathers, we have an obligation to continue to push and strive to love our kids as much as we can. We do the best we can we fail, but remember <coughs> what our example is. I pray today that your day is wonderful, it's lovely, that you get the gifts. The top 20 gifts that, you know, maybe they looked up on Google and said, okay, i got to give them something. But I pray even more that whether you deserve it or not, because you really don't deserve it, that you appreciate it in a way and that it does remind you. And push you to continue to be the best dad you can be throughout the year. Because God gave us the example and he said, here's your best in this life. Here's the most purposeful thing you could probably do in this world is to shape and build and mold a life that hopefully, in the end, honors God with the things that they do as well. Let's close as we uh, pray as we close and then we're going to sing the last song. Father, thank you for this day for the fact that you've given us this life with family and the connectedness that we have and so need. And Father, we thank you even more that you gave us the example of who you are. That Father, you have shown us in your word and through your actions what love truly is. And to the point that you sent your own son to come and die on the cross for the things that we did. That is the ultimate love. Father, help us as we crawl and trip and stumble through this life to just do our best to keep our eyes on you, to know that you have a beautiful life for us even as we fail, because your hand is always there, picking us up, nudging us forward and saying, come on, I've got a place for you, I've got something for you to do. Thank you for your love, and we ask this in Christ's name, amen. I was going to start with this, but I didn't, but I still like it. With God's love, he says, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. My magnet says Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> but really, when it comes down to it, you're all his favorite. In this world, we can't say that. But because of who he is, it's true. You are all his favorite. Live <laughs>
over grace to trust him more. If we look at grace, if we look at what he does constantly, which is just love us beyond anything we can remember, if we wash that over our hearts and our minds, we will know him more and more for who he really is and it will change our lives. So go and live loved this week. God bless you.